She already knows how to sign in. All right, wonderful. There's pens, paper, all that. So this is, uh, I refer to this as a real estate career session or how to launch a successful real estate career. And anyhow, I hope that's what you need to hear. So I talk usually about three things. One is why real estate. If you're willing to take time off on, a, what is this, Monday night, to come to attend, well, something like this, right? If you're willing to come out on a Monday night to come to something like this, you're probably looking for something new, something different, hopefully better in your business or professional life, right? I'm assuming that's why you're here. And if that's what you're looking for, why real estate, right? What are the advantages? What are the disadvantages? What do you actually have to do to be successful? How much money can you really make? We're going to talk about that. Um, then if you've decided to get into real estate, the next question is with whom? There are different kinds of real estate companies. They operate and are structured differently. And we'll look at some of the differences. And finally, how to get started. We're going to cover um, how do you get a real estate license? Uh, how long does that process take? How much does all of this cost? Right? Does that sort of sound like you know, good? Because that's what I'm going to talk about. So in the category of why real estate, I like to begin with some definitions of terms. There's the word broker and salesperson and broker and salesperson are terms for different kinds of real estate licenses. There's two types of real estate license. There's a real estate broker's license and a real estate salesperson's license. <clears throat> In a sense, a real estate salesperson can do everything a broker can do except two things, right? There's two things that you can do with a broker's license that you can't do with the salesperson's license. One is you can be independent. Salespeople have to work for brokers. Brokers don't have to work for brokers. Most of them do, but a broker can be independent. The other thing you could do with a broker's license is, well, you could brag about it, right? You could tell everyone that you've got the advanced license, the upgraded license, the top license, the best license. Most people don't know what you're talking about or particularly care, right? Now, if you want to become a broker, <coughs> excuse me, you have to have two years full-time experience in real estate or four years part-time experience in real estate, and you have to go past another task. So we're going to talk about how to be a salesperson first because, well, that's what you got to do. Then there's the word agent. And when you see people walking around in the office, you might say, they're real estate agents. Look at them. Um, the word agent is a little bit different because it's more of about a relationship. So in agency, you have a principal who hires an agent to represent the principal in dealings with third parties. If there is no third party, there is no agency. Right? So this is how this comes up in my context, somebody will say to me, well, if I get my real estate license and I join the office and I'd like to buy a house for myself, can I be my own agent, right? People ask me that, can I be my own agent? And the answer is no, technically, legally, no, you cannot be your own agent because by definition, agents represent other people. And if you're representing yourself, that's called the principal and you can't be an agent if you're the principal. Now that, by the way, was a technical answer to their question. I also know that wasn't really the question they were asking me. The question they were really asking me is, if I get my real estate license and I buy a house, can I save money on the commission because I have a license? And the answer is yes. You're not an agent in the transaction, but you're a licensee. And when we use the term licensee, we're referring to somebody who has a real estate salesperson's license or a broker's license. And through that professional affiliation, you could use the money that would have been a commission towards your purchase price and buy investment properties and things like that. Then there's the word realtor. The word realtor is a copyrighted designation of the National Association of Realtors, which is a trade association, which is sort of like a union, right? The National Association of Realtors is kind of like a union. You know, and um, think of it like the Teamsters, right? The Teamsters Union. If you want to drive trucks commercially, what do you need to do? 
do you have to join the Teamsters Union? Is there a law that says in order to drive a commercial truck, you have to be a member of the union? The answer is no, right? You understand? You might, what do you need to drive the truck? You need a commercial driving license. If you have the license, you can drive the truck. Joining the union, that's a different decision. So the law does not require that you join our union either, right? You understand? You don't have to become a realtor. You might choose to, and if you're going to sell residential real estate, one to four units, you're going to probably have to join the union because that's the association of realtors. That's where you get access to the multiple listing service. That's where you get that key that unlocks homes when the owner's not there. That's where you get access to all the forms to write offers and purchase contracts and list homes. You understand that's all controlled by the union. Right? Now, not everybody's going to do that. Because, I'll get to that in a moment. So if you get a real so estate I'm license, sorry, yeah, correct, okay. sure. So essentially the bottom four are all the same thing? No, an agent is somebody who represents another. Just because you have a license doesn't mean you're actually an agent yet. Okay. Supposing you're a brand new person and you don't have anyone that wants to buy or sell a house. Okay. You have a license. But you're not an agent. So then you can work with a salesperson. Right. You you can find when you find a client, now you're an agent too. Right. right. You need a client to be an agent. All you need to do is pass the test to be a licensee. Right. They're not the same thing. So <clears throat> when you pass the real estate exam, you could either work for a broker or you could not work for a broker, but you need to work for a broker. Now that may seem confusing, of those three, but when you um Sometimes people say to me, like, I don't really know what I'm going to do in real estate, right? I don't know who I want to work for or what kind of real estate I want to do. I don't know anything, but I'm kind of thinking I'd like to go get my real estate license. Anyhow, can I do that? And the answer is yes. You can get a real estate license without having a broker, right? It's called a non-working license, right? But you can go get one. A non-working real estate license is like a non-working car. You know, you have it in your garage, your friends come over, you can show it to them. You know, see, right? they can even sit in it. But if they want to go for a ride, well, no, you know, it's not a working car. So you can get a real estate license and renew it every four years and keep it alive perpetually. But you need a broker and activate it with a broker before you can earn money as a real estate agent. You understand? But the license is different. You can be a licensee, but not an agent. What could you do with a license? You could do just about, well, you could do all these things. Um, you probably already know you can get paid a commission for helping people buy and sell residential property. The same thing is true with commercial. We do commercial real estate as well. Um, mortgage brokers are real estate brokers and they're people that are that work for them. They're loan originators. Their loan officers have real estate salesperson licenses. Right. They you could do loans if you have a real estate license, you have to get it endorsed and take another course and pass another exam and pay another fee. Property management is when you're helping people that have a fourplex, sixplex or something like that. And they don't want to you know, have to find the tenants and everything. And business brokerage is when you're selling a business, not necessarily selling the real property. Right. Somebody's selling a, a hardware store, but they're not selling the building. Right. They're just selling the store. You can also do that with a real estate license. <clears throat> Why are people interested in real estate? Freedom and independence, financial rewards, investment opportunities, freedom and independence. You know, a long time ago, I have to admit it's a really long time ago now. I used to work for this really weird company. And you know, what was weird was is they told us what time we had to be at work each day. Right. It was like they had a rule right, that everyone had to show up at a particular time. They would let us know when we could go to lunch right, and how long lunch was going to be. And then at the end of the day, they would tell us when we could go home. Um, I believe that arrangement is called a job. Right. I think that's what that's called. Right. And so if you have a job. Well, so being in real estate is not like having a job. Right. You could look around the office and open up all the doors and look behind the cabinets and things like that. And you're not going to find time clocks for agents to punch. Right. You understand? We're not going to call you at 10 in the morning and say, hey, where are you? Right. You understand? It's not that kind of a deal. In fact, the being in real estate is much more like having a business than it is having a job. And the people that are most successful in real estate are people that want to have their own business. Right. It's much more like that. 
So there is freedom and independence. Do you know what one of the biggest disadvantages of being in real estate is? Freedom and independence. Uh, you know, that uh, the freedom is a gift not always wisely used. You know, there's a story of the guy that starts at a tech company and, you know, he's during the lunch period, he's talking to someone who's obviously been there for a long time. That guy is telling him everything about how the company works. And so the new guy asked the old timer, so that's great, thank you. How long have you worked here? And the old timer says, ever since they threatened to fire me. That's how long he's worked there, right? Have you ever met people like that? They work just enough so they don't get fired, right? And then the company pays them just enough so they don't quit, right? And they work out the sick, sick relationship. Well, I'm going to say it plainly. Real estate is a non-salary commission only profession. You understand what I'm saying? It can be a high paying, hard job, and it can be a very low paying, easy job, right? And so um, it's different, right? It's, it's not a job. Financial rewards, um, I'm going to go through exactly what that looks like. Um, investment opportunities, if you made a lot of money selling real estate, you would probably have no idea what to do with it. Isn't, isn't that what you were probably worried about? Um, or <clears throat> you might have ideas. And one of the things you could do with the money is you could invest in real estate. There's an old line from an old guy that uh, he's long gone now. His name was Will Rogers. He was a comedian and philosopher from uh, a long time ago. And he used to say, buy land they're not making any more of it, right? You know, and so if you ever wanted to invest in real estate, being in real estate is actually a good place to be. We have agents that are agents slash investors. We do workshops for investors. We do things to, we, we do things, right? Um, and that's, that's obviously one of the, the advantages of being in real estate, security. So I had a friend, I saw the free still friend, but he moved away. He went to um, San Jose State, uh, graduated in mechanical engineering, went to work for Hitachi in the hard drive division. 28 and a half years later, they laid him off. And they said, nothing, nothing personal, right? Nothing personal. Um, because they closed the department, shut down the division, they relocated the plant. So it wasn't that they, uh, I'm not saying he was a perfect engineer. But had he been a perfect engineer, he still would have been laid off, right? You understand? Nobody made a decision that he wasn't or was doing a particularly good job. They just decided that we don't need anyone to do that job here anymore. So in real estate, because you're an independent contractor, you're, you can fail at it, but you really don't get fired, right? You, you understand if you don't get along with us, you can take your license and go work someplace else. If you don't get along with anyone, you just tough it out for two years, go get your broker's license, and then you can be alone, right? Although I'm not really sure how that's going to work. Um, so there's some security. You can fail, but no one's going to find you. Traits of a successful real estate agent and the one about what is needed to succeed. I'm going to do this a little bit differently. These were all, notice how they all cleverly begin with E, right? But then I had to write other words in because, you know, E wasn't the best one. So I'm just going to say a little bit more plainly what real estate agents do. Would that be okay? The real estate business is a lot like having a seafood restaurant. You probably already thought of that. Um, and, if, and you have a seafood restaurant, but you also own a fishing boat. Now, the restaurant needs to be in a good location. You need to have somebody who knows how to cook. You need to have good recipes. You need to have servers that are trained. You need all that stuff. However, you also need to get up in the morning and go out on the fishing boat and catch some fish. Because if you don't catch any fish, you have nothing to serve in your restaurant. So in real estate, you need to understand that real estate is sales. It's professional sales. And what you're paid to do in sales is talk to people. And the more people you talk to, the more often you get paid. If you talk to some people, about real estate, you'd get paid some, but if you talk to a lot of people about real estate, you'd be paid a lot. Is, is there any, right? So the good news also is, is that real estate is something that virtually everybody wants. If you asked what percentage of the adult public is going to buy or sell real estate, if not now in the future, that's pretty much everybody. 
What that means is, is that everyone you know and everyone you meet is a potential client. And you have to be willing to talk to them. Now, to give you an example, I've been doing this for a while and I coach and mentor new agents. And so one of the things that we would start with is say, you ought to put together a list of everybody you know. Why? Because you know them. We know from studies done by the union, the National Association of Realtors, that when you ask people, how did they find their real estate agent? 4% of the time they said the agent contacted me. That would be like door knocking or cold calling somebody. 40% of the time they were referred by a family, friend, or coworker. Ah, right, you understand 40, I would much rather focus on the 40% than the four. So you would need as a starting point to make a list of everybody you know, and maybe reach out to them and let them know you're in real estate and perhaps have a conversation with them. We have scripts, we have ideas for what to say, we have ways of doing it you know, gently and, and all that. Now, people generally react one of two ways to hearing this. There's on one hand, I have people that say, well, no, I'm not gonna do that because I know I'm new and I don't want to practice on my friends and I'm not going to tell my friends that I'm in real estate because I don't want to be, I'm just not going to do that. Now, on the other hand, there are people that say, yeah, that's fine. I'm going to do it. That sounds, I'm no, I have no problems letting everybody I know, know that I'm in real estate. Now you understand if you take that first position, you've already taken 40% of the potential business off the table. Right, and you're gonna to have to do, it's gonna be a whole lot harder, but not impossible. One of the agents that I coached from a long, long time ago, um, she's the number one agent now in Almaden. And when she came, she and her husband had relocated from outside of Santa Clara County. So she didn't know anyone. And I had said to her, and she said, I don't know anyone. And I said, well, of the two groups of people, they're the people you know, and then there's the people you don't know which group is the larger group and obviously it's the people you don't know and so i have a, a plan for how to meet people right? and it's not just meeting first of all anyone you meet is a potential client or customer but there are some people that you could meet that would be more strategic that might refer business to you a loan agent a real estate lawyer a probate lawyer a bankruptcy lawyer somebody um that is um my neighbors painted their house and then they tinted it, right? Why would somebody paint their house and, tent, and have it tinted for, for killing termites? Why would somebody do that? What might they be thinking? They're going to, they're going to sell the house. So would it, be, if, would it be effective if we knew painters and landscapers and kitchen remodelers and house cleaners and movers and story? You, 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 you get the idea. So we want to reach out to the people that are going to be meeting the people that we want to meet and form some sort of a relationship with them. Um, I do this thing with credit unions. You'll be invited to come since I now have your email address. And we had um, the Key Point Credit Union is Apple's credit union. Just wanted to throw that out. Um, and the last buying seminar we had had over 40 people at it. And so you understand we're doing things in with a group of people. There are open houses. What else would you do? You might do open houses. We have a system to help you find open houses. You don't, it doesn't have to be your listing. It doesn't have to be our listing. But again, if you're doing an open house, you're going to meet people that are interested in buying and selling real estate. Let me give this more, and then there is more to it, but let's look at this as an example, right? Go, I'm going to start to do this as some examples. So Sometimes it's very difficult to figure out what amount of money you're going to make because you really don't know because you just don't know you've never done anything. But let's go the other way around. If you were, the, the whole idea of this, if we have closings, we have to have appointments. So let's say you made it a goal that you were going to work in real estate, you're going to work really hard and you're going to have an appointment a week. Right? You're going to get one buyer and one seller to talk to you every week. And I help agents with this. I meet with you. Know, but anyhow, you get one a week. And you're going to do that for 48 weeks because you're in real estate and you're going to take a month off. Right? Right. So, so now if you had 48 appointments, the question is how many of those appointments would likely translate into a buyer or seller? 
at this point you may not know because you've never had any appointments. But helping you with the appointment will increase your average, but let's say your conversion rate is only 25%. In other words, out of four appointments, only one person actually ends up buying and selling a house. Now, as you get better at this, the percentage goes up. I've had two appointments in the last two weeks and both of them have made offers on homes, right? I'm just saying, you know, when you get better at it, your conversion rate is closer to 75, 80%. But let's start with 25. If you had 48 appointments, one a week for 48 weeks and you converted 25% of them, that would be 12 real estate transactions. And if you use a million dollars as a price point, you know, slums in Silicon Valley, the, you know, you know hovels in Silicon Valley. And so I, th this gets, all goes on my YouTube channel and people sometimes have reacted to me saying, you know, a, a cheap home in Silicon Valley, $1 million. Our median is about 1.3. So if you did a million dollar sale, let's say it's not 6%, but it's only a 5% commission, two and a half, two and a half, I have a diagram that explains this. That means the gross commission income from the sale of a million dollar property on one side of the transaction is $25,000. If you had 12 of those, you would have grossed $300,000 in commissions. Huh? And what I'm hoping is, is that that would be enough for you to live on. I, I know you're gonna have to cut back. Right? You'd have to cut back some. All right, so $300,000 is from one transaction a month, which is one appointment a week. Now the question is, how are you gonna get an appointment a week? Right. So as a general rule of thumb, what I tell people, and it, it, your mileage will vary depending on who you're talking to and how good you're talking and a bunch of other things. But let's assume you need to have 50 conversations with people about buying or selling real estate in order to have an appointment. So if you work five days a week and every day you had 10 conversations with people, right, that would be 50 a week of conversations or one appointment a week or one transaction a month or $300,000 in commission income. Right. So now sphere of influence, talking to the vendors and other people, open houses and new homes. There, I have, there's a list of things, right? So now what we would be doing is laying out, well, what is the plan so that you're going to talk to that many people every day, right? And I don't do cold calling. If you like door knocking, Go for it, right? But there are other people to talk to besides that. Does that make sense? Right? And it's sales. Now, there are some people that are really good at fishing, but they're ter they have terrible restaurants. One of the agents that I'm coaching was telling me, gee, this woman, this other agent, I think is good. She's been in the business 15 years, and the things that they're, she's saying is, is not very smart. Because they don't really, she does you know, you understand what I'm saying? There are some people that are really good at the talking to people part of the business and not really good at the real estate part of the business, right? And they still make money because they're really good at talking to people. And then there are people that are really good at the real estate business, but they're terrible to talk to people and they don't have anything to do. Those two should get married, right? You understand? <laughs> Right. So one can go out and get customers and the other one can actually keep them from hating you by the time it's over. But you need to have both, right? You, you're not only, when you catch the fish, you got to have the restaurant ready, right? To come and serve it. Otherwise, you know. So we work on that. Now, my system is at the beginning, get the appointment, right? And so when I, when I train agents, I, I train them on how to get the appointment, not necessarily how to do the appointment. I have videos and I do cover that. But at that point, I'm going to go with you because it will be a lot easier than you trying to learn everything that you might be asked, right? So how are real estate agents paid? This was a 6% commission, which is a nice round number. Mm -hmm. If it was a million dollars, that'd be $60,000 in gross commission split between two offices, typically, one that finds the buyer, one that finds the seller, and typically be 50-50. Each office would get 30,000. Some offices have mentoring programs that start agents at 50% or below. Um, we, I'll, I'll explain how our program works, but it's, um, I'm going to skip this. I'll go to this. So we have a progressive commission plan. 
what that means is when you join the office for your first three transactions, you're at 6040. And that's because we drag you through your first three transactions. And then it jumps to 7030. And then after a few more transactions to 8020, and eventually all the way up to 9010. And that's better, right? So you can sort of see at the same $30,000 how it would look, we don't do the 50%, but how it would look all the way through into where you're at 90%. The idea, of course, is, is that by that time, you don't need as much help. Is the state agent able to buy the selling handle? Yes, yeah, so they call that a, what is that, a double agent? No, 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 a dual agent. It's possible to be the agent of the buyer and the seller. It's called a dual agency. It creates some extra paperwork and some diligence. Right. I mean, if you think about it, if you're getting divorced, would you use the same attorney your spouse was using to save money? Probably not. Right. So one could argue that there's a conflict of interest because the seller wants the most money possible and the buyer wants to pay the least possible. Sometimes real estate transactions are not that adversarial. They're not like a divorce, right? You know, they're not anywhere near that adversarial. And everybody has a pretty good idea what the property is worth already, right? You understand? And so in facilitating that, it isn't necessarily a conflict of interest, mm -hmm. right? You know, everybody, you disclose everything to everybody. You make sure that every, when I do this, every inspection report and disclosure is going to be done, everything. Right. So there will be nothing not done because it increases the possibility of liability just because it's hard to carry water on both shoulders without spilling it somewhere. Yeah. So there is a relationship between services and commissions. In other words, the more you get, the less they do. Right. You understand there are offices that pay 100% which um, sounds really good, right? But you have to think about it for a second from a business point of view. And if uh, we're paying 100% commission, then how do we keep the lights on at night? Right? You, you, you understand if you had a shoe store and you sold the shoes for $100 and you paid the salesperson $100 to sell the shoes for $100, right? You understand something must be going on in the back room Right, because you're not making any money out in the front. So there are offices that do that, but then they charge fees, monthly fees, and you, you, yes. you, you, know, you have to sign an agreement. Whether you sell a house or not, you have to write them a check every month. That's a desk fee? That's, that's, it's called a desk fee, right. Then there are some offices, they range from um, $130, $150 to $600, depending on that. We do not charge a desk fee. If you don't make any money, we don't make so you're, you can, we don't really do the re referral only so much, but there's some people that we call it a bird dog where you don't want to join the union, you don't want to join the Association of Realtors or the MLS, and you're going to refer people. I have a team and I mentor people and that, so for example, I wrote an offer today and agents that wanted to participate in it. Um, I go with people on appointments. Um, I do things to give people opportunities to meet buyers and sellers. We have agents that do it part-time. I call it dual career because it sounds better, I think, than part-time. But basically, it means you've got another life or another job. So that if you're doing this as a part-time gig, then the mentoring part becomes more important because it's very difficult for a full-time agent to learn everything they need to know. I, I'm doing this series on contracts, which you could all come to it's during the day. And I go through every line. I mean, I explain everything you do, ever want to know about real estate contracts. But very few people after going through that are ready to write one, right, on their own without, I mean, because it's just, wow, well, you know. So I helped Monica, who recently closed her first transaction, and um, she didn't even have her login to the software to write an offer, let alone any clue as to what to do. But she had a buyer, she had done the first part, found a buyer who wanted to buy a home and found him a home that he wanted to buy. And I wrote the offer. So, you know, so everything moved to head, right? You, you understand that you, and I have hundreds of videos. I, when I do my classes for how to, pat, for the, how to get, make money in real estate, I broadcast them. 
I record them, and I have hundreds of videos uh, on how to do just about anything. I had some agents doing an open house for the first time this weekend, and so among this packet that I send them has a video I made, and, and this is why I always tell them it's a short two hour long video on how to do an open house, right? With a 50 page handout and, you know, and usually people have learned more than they ever wanted to know about doing an open house, right? So by doing that, it helps you if you're doing something part time and you need to learn something, it's there, but then we'll help you. And of course, full time means, you know, it's, it's hard to know what that means. Sometimes it means you don't have another job or a, or a family, but um, sometimes there are people that do that are putting in more effort than people that don't. Choosing an office. They're national, they're bro boutique, and they're cloud. And what we're doing is something, I'm going to explain how we're sort of a blend of this. My background is I was the vice president of a Century 21 group for a ridiculously long period of time, 21 years. And I was also the director of training for Century 21 for Northern California, Northern Nevada region for five years. And I was a productivity coach for Keller Williams for most of the offices in Silicon Valley for seven years. Don't add those up. All right. I was only nine. When I when I got my only nine, right? So um, and so I work at um, the, the the national brokerages, right? The big box companies. Um, there are cloud. I mean, I'm going to explain where we are in the middle. Cloud brokerages. There are now these. There are some brokers that do not have any physical locations whatsoever anywhere. None. Everything is in the cloud. The, the biggest one that's doing this. You create this little avatar, like a little cartoon character, and you beam up into the, you, know, you walk around and you sit in this little virtual chair and, you know, um, there's a, a guy walks in and talks and there's a screen, you know, that, that's where all their training is because they have no offices anywhere, right? Nothing, right? Now that's a bit extreme, right? Now what we're doing in the, the boutique brokerages, which are the independents, which are sort of on a resurgence right now, because not everybody wants to eat at McDonald's, right? you, you know, they may be the biggest, but that doesn't mean everyone wants to eat there. And what I've done is I've taken the training because I was the main trainer for Century 21 and Keller Williams in this area. And so we're doing all of that training here, right? All of the training that you would get anywhere else. And uh, we don't, we have more things to offer right? and less fees. How about that? A lot less fees. When people are getting started, there's coaching, training, and mentoring. These are words that you'll hear if you're talking to real estate offices or doing research on should I, who should I join. What we, the thing that I went through with, if you wanted to gross $300,000, you need to close 12 transactions, which would mean you would need 48 appointments, which would mean you would need so many contacts. That's sort of what coaching is about, right? You understand, making a plan and implementing the plan. And I talk to the people that are in my group every week just to make sure everything is going right. Training is a little more obvious, you know, you're in a room, there's a handout, there's a screen, there's somebody talking. Um, and that's either online or in person. And mentoring means that I go with people on transactions. So uh, Monica had her first listing appointment, it was in Fremont. I went there with her um, so I could answer the questions. All she had to do was get the appointment. I took care of the rest of it. The listing is going to be coming on the market soon. But mentoring means that I'd actually help you with your clients, answering questions, that sort of thing. One of the agents I'm coaching, Shamal, I spoke to her buyer for a long time, like 40 minutes on the phone, about what these inspections and reports actually meant. You know, what does this, is this mold, is it fungus, what should I, you know, that sort of thing. Um, anyhow, that helps. So how to get started, how are we doing? Uh, that was an honest explanation of the real estate business. Or what, or, um, not everybody, you know, anyhow. How to get started. So in order to get a real estate license, you have to do two things. One of them is you have to complete three college level courses in real estate. That does not mean you have to go to college. That's included in the package that we have. Then you have to pass an exam given by the California Department of Real Estate. And when you've done those two things, you can now apply to get a license. 
So before you can take the state exam, you have to do these three college courses. And one of them has to be real estate principles and one of them has to be real estate practice. And the other one is an elective that could come from anything on this long list of electives. I would point out that accounting, economics, and business law is on this list. If you have ever taken accounting, economics, or business law from a junior college or better, and you can get your hands on a copy of the transcript. It doesn't have to be an original. This isn't like applying to Harvard. Um, you've got one of the courses. What if it's from an international university? If it's accounting, they'll take it. Okay. Yeah, account because accounting hasn't fundamentally changed since the time of the Babylonians. So the state doesn't, if it's accounting, what's the difference? But our undergrad in India is three years, is that okay? It doesn't matter. It has to be one oh, 45, one, one, oh, one okay. three semester unit or okay. equivalent quarter unit, 45 hour in length or more. Okay. That's all you need. Oh, okay. And so um, obviously they take accounting from anywhere that's an accredited university. And I also did some courses like UC Berkeley and Extension. Yeah. Where I had done accounting, would they honor that? They would honor that if it's a three semester unit or a 45 yeah. hour or the equivalent quarter units, they'll, they'll honor it. Okay. Uh, but they'll take accounting from India or anywhere. I've had people from China and India, and what's the difference? All right, accounting is accounting. They, they needed help translating one of them uh, into figuring out what it was that the person had taken, but the, the, they give you credit for that. Now, we use legal aspects as our third course, which is still something to think about. Because even if you have a master's in accounting, the Department of Real Estate is not going to ask very many accounting questions. Right? You understand? So what that does is it shortens the time period for getting a license. But you might still want to take, you understand, they're not going to ask you any account. Accounting might satisfy the requirement, but they're not going to ask accounting questions on the exam. So we'll, I'll get into that. So what would be your options for getting these courses? You could go to college. Very few people actually do that, especially for principles and practice because it's time consuming and not, not, not inexpensive. My program involves an online college level course component. Now the way an online college level course works is you log, you, you log into the course. And that's important because it starts this timer ticking. And after 18 days has elapsed, you're eligible to take the final exam. You don't have to take it at 18 days. You just can't take it any sooner than 18 days. The final exam is a online final exam. You can take it at home and it's an open book test. Let me, let me go through that one more time. The three final exams for the college level courses are online, at home, open book, cheat as much as you want to. Final exam. You can cheat as much as you want to. They give you three hours to get 75 out of 100 questions correct. Did I mention that this is an open book test? Right. Now, the reason the state makes you wait 18 days is you could pass right now. If we gave you the book with an internet connection, logged you in to the final exam, left you alone, or there's no requirement that you be alone, but we left you alone for three hours, you could find 75 answers just by going through the book or searching on the internet. And then that would make the whole thing look stupid, so they make you wait 18 days, so that it would have been possible for you to have spent 45 hours studying the material. This, as you can see, is not the most difficult part of getting a license. Online, open book, cheat as much as you want to, and you're, you've done that. Now you can take the state licensing test. Remember, there's two things. One is the three college courses. The other is passing the exam given by the California Department of Real Estate. It's not an online at-home test. You have to go to one of their facilities to take it. Their facilities are Oakland, Sacramento, Fresno, Orange County, and San Diego. Oakland is the closest to us. Right? And it's um, not an open book test. They're very paranoid that you're sneaking in questions or sneaking out questions. It's a highly monitored exam. It's 150 multiple guess, I mean, multiple choice questions. A, B, C, D, pick the best answer, no essays, no true false, no fill in the blanks. 
you have to get 70% of the questions right in order to pass the state exam. Does that sound like a particularly high score to require? 70%. If you were laying on the operating table and your brain surgeon came in and said, look, I'm new at this, but don't worry, I passed the brain surgeon's exam, I got 70% of the questions right. I nailed that test. I got said, that's not, that doesn't sound very good, right? You, you understand that your, your brain surgeon missed more than one out of every four questions they asked them about the subject of brain surgery. That doesn't sound very good, right? The 30% they didn't know, maybe that's what they're doing to you. So my point is, you don't have to be a brain surgeon to get a real estate license. You might have already noticed that, right, from meeting real estate agents, that you don't have to be a brain surgeon to get a real estate license. All you have to do is get 70% of the questions right, and you're in. Having said that, <clears throat> every time the state gives this test, they fail more than half the people that are in the room. And many of those people, they have failed before. They will let you take this exam an unlimited number of times. I have met many people that have taken it more than 10 times. My guesstimate is, is that they fail close to 70% of their first try. How would I know that? They produce a list every week of people taking the test. And I can see who's taking it this week and then they're taking it again. And then, they, yeah, I mean, you know, it's kind of obvious who's not but passing. How would it feel then that if the person's given a correct answer, it's multiple choice? Because people, so they don't know the right answers. So let's stop. All of these people that are failing, right, which is almost 70% of everyone taking it on the first try, and more than 50% every time they give the test. Of all those people that are failing, how many of them were able to get through successfully those three online open book, cheat as much as you want to, college courses? And the answer is they all did. Right, because you can't even get to this step until you've done that step. So the point is, is that just doing those college courses does not mean you're getting a real estate license. But how about this? Those college courses, I have to be careful because I put this on YouTube. And, um, those three, you know the phrase diploma mills, right? You ever heard that phrase? So the people that are doing this are not trying to fail you, the college level course material. That's not the reputation they want. They want people to say, ooh, that was so easy, right? That's what they, they want everybody to say in their reviews. So they're not trying to fail anyone. Then there's the Department of Real Estate. The Department of Real Estate is trying to fail. Read their bulletin, they're proud at how many people they fail. They say they think they ought to fail more people. They think that by failing all these people, they're protecting the public from real estate agents who don't know what they're doing. That might be a nice idea, except that the questions that they're asking in this exam are not designed to protect people from real estate agents. They're just picky, sometimes inane questions that they that they have. All right. So those are two different. Everybody, my. So what I do that's different is I actually teach people how to pass the exam, and I have 12 classes, and they're taught live and in the room, and they're broadcast on the internet. They're sliced up like a pizza. The 12 slices. Because I, I, I say it's like a pizza because like a pizza, there's no first slice, right? There's no, they're, they're all taught as independent modules. You can start with anyone. You can take them in any order. You can repeat them as often as you can stand. It. They're broadcast on the internet and they're recorded. And what I'm doing in the classes is I'm focused on what do you need to know to pass the real estate exam? It's not my intention to teach you the principles of real estate. I want to teach you how to pass the real estate exam. So this comes after you finish the... You do them at the same time. I'm going to talk more about the college courses in a second. Let me be clear. So right now we're having a sale, the whole live, everything, in-person, college-level credit, practice testing program, Saturday workshop, everything, $498. That includes the college-level, live classes, practice testing, and the Saturday workshop. Um, for some people that are not, a, they can't ever come to a live class because they live in Southern California or something like that, I have another option. The college level credit comes from an affiliate called Online Ed. Online Ed is approved by the Department of Real Estate to give you the certificates of completion you need to go take the state exam. I don't do college level. I teach people how to pass the exam. 
And our practice testing program comes from a friend of ours called Real Estate Trainers. I'm just saying uh, that's where it comes from. So the four components are college level and live classes. You'd be doing those at the same time. I'll get back to that. Then practice testing in the Saturday workshop before you go take the exam. I'll get back to that. So virtually everyone who goes through my course um, passes the state exam. I don't know if you've seen my Yelp reviews, but I have decent Yelp reviews. I encourage people to come and sit through a class for free so you can see if you like it or not. Um, we have placement assistance to help you find an office if you're looking for help. $498. Now, the timeline is principles, you can't take the final exam until 18 days has elapsed from when you started it. That's about two and a half weeks. You can't start practice until after those 18 days has elapsed on principles. That's another two and a half weeks in to get through practice. And if you need to do the third course, you would have to do that at the end of it. So this is where having accounting could save you two and a half weeks because you don't need to do the third course. Otherwise, you would have to it'd be seven and a half weeks just to get through the three college courses. And only then could you apply to take the state exam. And right now, the state is taking about eight weeks to get people to test it. Right, so if you did it as fast as you possibly could, it's still three and a half months from beginning to end. Now, let me just say this about the college and the principles and practices. Many years ago, I had decided to um, take my material and get it approved for real estate principles credit. So I talked to the Department of Real Estate about doing that, and the Department of Real Estate said, they sent me a list, and, and this was the requirement for the textbook. The textbook had to be 400 pages long, and it had to have an average of 300 words in a page. That's, that's what it said. And I asked the person, how would you know how long my book is? I mean, you can count the pages, but how, I mean, how do you know? And he says, oh, well, we have a guy who goes through the book and randomly picks out pages and counts how many words are on those pages. And then they that gives us an average words on the page. And then we go through the book, and if you have a form, you don't get credit for the form. If you have a picture, you don't get credit for the picture. And we figure out how many pages of text you have in your book. And once we do that, we multiply the number of pages of text you have times your average number of words on the page. And if it's above the right number, your book is approved. And if it's below the number, you're rejected. And so I said, is anyone going to read my book? And I guess we don't have time to read. Right, you, you understand they're gonna weigh the book. So the principal's book is about 500 pages long. Most of what's in it will not be on the state exam. The practices book is about 500 pages long. Not only won't most of it be on the state exam, but most of what's in practices is also in principles. The third course, the legal aspects course is 500 pages long. Most of it will not be on the state exam. And 60% of it is in principles and practices. So if you go to college and you took a class in accounting, English literature and microbiology, those are three different college courses, right? They don't look like each other. The textbooks have nothing in common. Principles, practice, and legal aspects are not like that. They're all pretty much the same material. If you go through the table of contents for the three textbooks, you'll see they have the same chapter headings, right? You flip through, you see the same forms, some of the same charts and diagrams. Yeah. So when people say, well, which of yours are principles and which are practice and which are, well, they're all jumbled together, right? Because they're all really asking about the same thing. So when people are, sometimes what people do is they go, they wait to take, you can take all three final exams after seven and a half weeks. So sometimes people wait till they've gone through all my classes, right? Sometimes, but to pass one of these final exams is not very difficult because there are these quizzes that you can take as you go along and you can take them as often as you want to. The final exam is not only an online open book test, but most of the quizzes, most of the questions on the final exam are the same questions that you were practicing on the quizzes. You know, I mean, this is, they're not trying to fail you, right? You understand what I'm saying? So just go ahead and take the final and pass it. You're going to pass it. 
um, and don't, don't really worry about this content. What hit me is I'd written this book a long time ago, and <clears throat> and I and I there's a thing that I talk about in the school called RESPA, R-E-S-P-A, the Real Estate Settlement Procedures Act. And I was telling this class that there was only four things you really needed to know about RESPA for the state exam. And this guy said, then how come your book has 12 pages on RESPA, right? If there's only four things you need to know, why did I have 12 pages? Um, I had a history of the legislation. I had excerpts from the Department of Housing and Urban Development information book. And my answer was, because I need 400 pages, right? That's why I spent, I had 12 pages on RESPA. And so I thought, this is stupid. Why am I, you know, I'm changing what I'm teaching to fit this construct that really has nothing to do with reality or taking the state exam. So I, the college level course, you just do through the online open book, cheat as much as you want to. And I focus on what I know the Department of Real Estate wants you to know, right? And not on things that I know they don't want you to know. Um, one reason this process takes a long time is, the, is fingerprint. When you apply to get a license or to take the exam, they're gonna want you to submit a, a sample of your fingerprints to the Department of Justice, and that's gonna take six weeks. So, and they won't give you a license until it's happened. They don't care that you're a nurse or a teacher, a member of law enforcement, and you're, they don't, they, they, everybody has to go get the form, have their fingerprints taken and sent it to you. It's just the way. The license is good for four years. Every four years, you have to renew it. You renew it by taking 45 hours of continuing education. If you're a member of the union, they give you that for free. Right? It's through actually online ed. My buddies um, have a 45-hour continuing education package that costs nothing if you're a member of the Association of Realtors. That's information on how to contact us. Um, I took a screenshot. This is one of my... Yelp stories. So at one point, I was running ads on Yelp, and they showed 123 five-star reviews. And the breakdown of them was I had 123 five-star reviews, and I had a four-star review. Right? This is, I, I know it's. I, I'm, I was hurt when I got a four-star review. Um, when I stopped advertising with Yelp, they filtered over 100 five-star reviews. So now when you go to my Yelp page, you'll see there's like 35 five-star reviews. But if you click on the unfiltered, the, the filtered ones, you're gonna see there's a more, there's even more than that now. And anyhow. Didn't they talk to you? I have a business I've been running for 11 years. And then we talk every month asking for $600 to come back for yeah. the reviews. Right, and then when I stopped doing it is when all of a sudden my um, five-star reviews started to disappear from the site. I stopped so, them after that. Yeah, so anyhow, nice. But I, I had a screenshot, anyhow, but the, they also they also sort of say the same. So if you wanted to, first of all, if you wanted to sit through a free class, there's one Wednesday night, 6.30, you could go to my website and click on free guest lesson and come to a class. If you want to sign up now, and I know you would love to just sign up now, you can click on the sign up now button. And we're having a, a, a sale, which I already talked about. You have to do two things to sign up. You click on the green button, and then that takes you to online ed's page. You get a discount, and the book is a PDF. This is why it's only $99 for all three college courses. Now, this is not a book you're going to use, keep, treasure, refer to in the future. It's not one of those books, right? You understand this is, it's a PDF. And having it as a PDF actually has an advantage. Let's say you're taking the final exam and they're asking you under FERPTA, what is the amount that the buyer is required to withhold in escrow? Let's say they asked you that question, and you're like, what? <laughs> I have no idea, but you, you you have the PDF, and you do either, what is it, Control-F or Command-F, depending on your religion, right? You understand, whichever, whatever it is, and you type in M-I-R-P-T-A, and you realize that it's going to find every place in that book that it talks about FERPTA, and you'll finally find the place that it says 15%. 
is the percentage that the buyer is supposed to hold in escrow under FERPA, and you click that answer and you go on to the next question. So um, then you you have to pay the college level directly, you add it to the card, you pay them, it's a simple thing. Then you come back, you click on the red button, and then now you're enrolling in the live classes, the practice testing program, the Saturday workshop. The Department of Real Estate wants those two things separate because they don't want, they've actually written a letter suggesting this, let's just say, that um, I'm not implying, because I used to have people write one check or pay, make one payment and I would just sign them up. And the Department of Real Estate said that I was confusing people by telling them that my classes were college level credit. And my response was, you've never heard me explain this, obviously, <laughs> because you wouldn't be saying that if you've ever heard me, but they don't care. So anyhow, you click on the green button, you pay the college level people, you click on the red button, you pay me, uh, you know, and you're in the course. The total would be $498.99 for the college level and then $399 for the live classes, practice testing program, center to work. So when you see the rating class schedule, is it a timeline as to how long we can take that? Like if you're traveling? The Department of Real Estate, the Business and Professions Code says that a college level course must be completed within one year of starting it. Most of the schools give you six months because they want you to pay attention. Sorry, I was talking about the live classes. The live classes, I have people that have been going for years. Okay. I'm not encouraging that. But I'm going to give you, if you hit the end of my time period, which is six months, my assistant will automatically send you an email and say, do you want an extension? After a year, we're going to send you another email and say, are you still in? <laughs> you know, so, but I can't control the college. The college level has to be finished within a certain period of time. But yes, you can take time off and go. And my website where the videos can be watched, the hosting is actually go to webinar. I use their hosting service because I'm cheap. Um, and that software that works everywhere in the world, pretty, I mean, that's not a... Yeah, so I'm asking for generally December, they're traveling and all that. You can, I have people that do that. And some people study when they're gone because everything's recorded and they can. Others just take a break, whatever, it's okay. We'll be here when you come back. Hopefully, unless you've heard something. All right. Was that enough? Any other questions? Uh, what's the average time a new agent takes to close the first week? Well, I've never been asked that person before. Um, so Vicky joined the office. Um, I'm doing a, I have this thing for open houses. Vicky does an open house. She meets people at the open house that want to buy the house. She gets them to buy the house. That was in June of, last, of a year or so ago. And she got her first commission check in July. Now, I'm not saying that's normal. However, if you're doing stuff, it's possible to meet someone. I, I do this thing with the credit unions, these home buying seminars, which agents can go to. I did one on Tuesday, met somebody on Saturday. We looked at homes on Sunday and wrote offers on Wednesday. Right? So that's possible. Um, some people take three to six months before they do anything. But the plan is to do something like right away. And it's possible to do something right away. Average, it's hard to say because Kamal just closed his first transaction and he works at Facebook and this wasn't, you, you're saying this was a thing on the side, you, you know, I mean, he wasn't, this wasn't ever a full-time thing. So it depends on, 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 on your focus and who you know and that sort of thing. And when we start off, do we get to shadow and stuff? Yes, that's what, yeah. Yeah, you do, you get to. You get to watch. All right. Well, that's um, that's all I got then. Thank you so much. Thank you for coming. Great information. I've been thinking about it for a while. So. How did you find out about us? I was here on the, the day they were closing.